The following program is made possible by the faithful friends and supporters of Higher Aim. Well, welcome. I'm so glad you've joined us today because today we're going to have a lot of fun because we are going to ask and then answer the question, what do women want to know about men? What do women really want to know? What do they need to know? What are the questions that they really have? And there are four of them that I've found over the years that I hear consistently when I visit with women when they're concerned about their husbands. And I'm going to answer those today. But for the greatest springboard that we could ever get is Genesis 1, 27. And it says this, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Let me just reiterate to you that men are distinctly different from women. Women are distinctly different from men. You know that, I know that, but they are distinctly different, not only biologically, anatomically, but they are different emotionally. We are all hardwired differently, and that's important. You see, men view things the way they do because they're men. Women view things the way they do because they're Women, because of this hard wiring that is different, it's important for us to be able to wrestle with some things that are very, very important. Now, the first question is this. Women want to know, why does he always have to be in charge? I mean, why does he have to be in charge? That's a big question. In fact, I need to tell you that the way God has created man is geared toward being in charge. Again, ladies, you need to remember, this is his hard wiring. God created him like this, and we could carry on this creation that has been engrafted, if you will, designed by our creator. In fact, there in Genesis 2.15, the Bible says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. I mean, he was by himself, and this was his God's plan for Adam to work the garden, to take care of that garden, to take leadership and taking care of, of the garden. Before there was even a woman, God gave man a task, and that was to take a lead, to take care of the stewardship responsibilities that God had given him. And God has put that in every man. However, you need to understand that God also gave Adam and Eve together a very key responsibility and partnership that they would uh, create and that they would take care of. Look at, at the scripture verse here in Genesis 1, 20, 28. God blessed them and said to them, this is together, be fruitful and increase in number. By the way, again, I'm not trying to uh, ride a hobby horse about same-sex marriage, but there's no way they can be fruitful and increase in number. If that was the norm, our, all of humanity would only have one lifespan, no children. God gave them this plan, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Remember, God is giving this command to both Adam and Eve. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So there is a partnership of work, but that work first was initiated by man to take charge and lead. So here's the deal. Men feel like men when they are in charge. Let me give you two purposes of marriage. Here they are. I'm going to give them to you. You need to write them down. These aren't in your notes, but they are procreation, partnership. Procreation and a partnership. It is to be intimate, to produce children, and to have someone to walk this life together with. However, you and I need to understand that when men are in charge, they find great fulfillment in providing as well as giving instruction, providing protection and provision and giving direction. That is how God has created men. Ladies, you need to understand that. That's why they always want to be in charge, because it's part of the hardwiring. But men, I need to also tell you that it's important that we learn how to take charge. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of things. Number one, accept responsibility that you need to lead. Be the leader that God wants you to be. So accept the responsibility. Number two, construct plans to lead. 
That construction of plans should not be done in a vacuum where you decide this is what we're going to do, and woman, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. No, uh, when you get up off the floor, then you'll find out that God wants you to involve them in the construction of the plans. If you want that vision of where and how you're to go to be received, you need to share that. And the construction of plans is very, very important. I'll never forget when we were looking at uh, different churches, uh, one of the guys uh, on our development team, uh, and we traveled all over the country looking at different churches, when we would walk into a church, he would leave the group and he would move over to one side of the, the church building and he'd be looking at different angles. And, and he was always looking for th- at things from a different perspective. I love that. Uh, In fact, men, you need to realize your wife can give you a different perspective about the plans that you may have, and you need her input because she may see something that you don't see, but you need to accept responsibility to lead, and you need to construct plans with her. Number three, you need to take action. Just don't make a plan. Do the plan. Uh, Just don't pray about the plan. Put put prayers to, to a foot path, that you will take the first step. And then I would tell you, share the dream. Share where you're going. Talk about it. And that's important. You see, if you don't share it, you'll just be taking a walk by yourself. And if you're leading, God wants you to make sure that you have fellowship. But if you will construct plans together and you will take action together, you'll be able to share the dream together. And that's very, very powerful. There's a second question women want to have answered. Women want to know, why won't he be more sensitive and caring? You ever thought that about your husband, ladies? Why won't he be be more sensitive to me? Why won't he be more caring to me? Maybe you've thought that. Maybe you've actually said that. Yeah, I wish you'd be more sensitive. You just kind of bruise me sometimes emotionally. And he, and he goes, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, or he may have just given you a look like a calf looking at a new gate, which is a Texas phrase that literally means he doesn't even know how to handle this. And you may be wondering why he's not as sensitive and as caring. Now, stop for a moment. You need to realize he's not a woman. So therefore, he's not going to be able to relate to you like a woman. He is a man. Men relate like they are wired. And that's important. Ladies, you relate to your spouse like you are wired. And so therefore, you need to understand that uh, he's not wired intentionally to be sensitive and caring. He's got to work at that if he's going to be. But again, I will tell you, there are studies that indicate that a man, as much as he wants to be, cannot wire himself to become sensitive and caring. But he can do acts that are sensitive and caring. He's not bent that way. Let me show you where he is, Ben. There in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, the Bible says this, to the woman, he said, this is God saying, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Stop for a second. I've shared this with you before. If you're thinking that that verse means that she wants you sexually, you need to think again. I, I remember reading that as a, a young man, and I'm thinking, man, God created things really good. He's made a woman who's going to want me sexually. <laughs> That's not what that means. Let me tell you what it means. It means that she's going to want to rule you, but you're going to rule. She's going to want to lead you, but it's your responsibility to lead. That's what that means verse means. And that sets up the struggle. So that's why I started with the first question. Why does he always have to be in charge? Because God put him in charge. Not because he's better than you. Not because he's physically stronger than you. It's God's order. He created man first. He created man first so he will lead first. However, there's going to be a tension in that relationship between husband and wife always in this area because of the bent. And by the way, guys, if you're, if you're concerned 
about uh, your wife wanting to lead you, and you're always concerned that, quote, unquote, uh, she is trying to manipulate you, and she's trying to use her emotions to get her way, you need to realize she's wired that way right there. But it's your responsibility to lead. This is part of the setup here. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. So in essence, what is happening is God said, okay, because you sin, you're going to be focused on work. You're going to be focused on performance. You're going to be focused on taking whatever it takes to make a living for your family, and it's going to be tough. So the way God has created man, and as the result of the fall, men are going to be more focused upon provision, protection, work. That's why it's been said that men find their fulfillment in their profession, Women find their fulfillment in their relationship. You go, I don't get that. Listen, I didn't make the rules. I I wasn't in charge of the genetic or emotional engineering. God was. God had a plan way before you and I had a plan. But the problem is we don't like his plan. And our whole culture is trying to say, no, I want it like this. And I don't like it like that. And I want it to be like this. Let me just tell you, the greatest peace that you will ever have in your life is when you stop trying to control your life and begin to follow the Lord. When you stop trying to change the circumstance because you don't like the situation and you want it like you want it because you want it like that. You and I need to understand that the greatest peace will flow in all of our relationships that God has given us when we learn how to operate how God has created us. You won't be uh, trying to paddle upstream. You'll begin to get momentum in your life and joy in your relationships when you stop trying to change each other and realize how God has created you and then go with the flow because he's created us in a very special way for a very important purpose. You see, here's the deal. Men think action, women think interaction. Men want to do something. Women uh, want to have the interaction. It's very interesting uh, that we just don't get that. You can hear that, but we don't get that. We don't like that. We, we, if you're a, a woman, you're wanting, I want him to talk to me. Uh, and a man saying, I, I'm, yeah, but I want to do something. I want to do something more than I want to talk about it. So therefore, that leads me to a third question. Women want to know why he won't talk. Women really want to know, why won't he talk to me? Well, I shared with you last time we were together, a lot of men zip it because they don't want to light the fuse of a bomb that they know will go off in their face. They're thinking, if I don't bring it up, maybe she'll not bring it up. And therefore, everything will be okay because they don't want to interact. And that's the problem here. In fact, uh, Look at Genesis 3.20. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. God gave Adam a task, and it was Adam, not another woman, but Adam named his wife Eve. Listen, that, that, that's important for us to know that, that uh, man is moving toward how God has created him. And his focus is of action, not feeling. So therefore, talking is more about feeling than action. You see, men are going to feel more comfortable doing something to express how they feel rather than talking about how they feel. That's why they struggle. Men feel like men when they do, not when they feel. I had uh, a guy come up to me and say, you know, the difference between coaching women in sports and men in sports is this. Girls need to feel good in order to play well. Men 
need to play well in order to feel good. You understand that? That's how different we are. Is either one more right than the other? No, they're just different. And you need to realize, ladies, men are not geared to talk. You maybe want them to talk, but they're not real comfortable with talking. They will talk, but it will be under stress. And, of course, guys don't use that as an excuse to say, you don't want to stress me out, honey, do you? Let's not talk about this. They're, men are feeling like if they don't talk about it, maybe it'll go away. <laughs> and guess what? Guys, you know, unless you talk about it, it won't ever go away. So it's important that you realize that there is a problem. By the way, women want to talk about how to fix it. Men just want to fix it. They want to do something to fix it. And by the way, uh, I don't know about you, but I've had this happen to me multiple times. My wife begins to tell me a problem, and before she can even complete the sentence, I, when I understand what she's saying the problem is, I interrupt her and say, let me tell you three things that we can do to fix this or what you need to do to fix this. You need to blah, blah, blah. And she didn't want that. I'm thinking, doesn't she want to fix the problem? Here's the deal. No, she doesn't. She just wants to talk about how to fix it. She wants to make sure I'm listening to her. She wants to process. I just want to get it done. You see, we are so different. That's how God has created us, and we need to understand that's what creates a lack of wanting to talk because men want to do. Ladies, if you're married to a man like that, you're married to someone that's got touch with his masculinity, and if you are trying to get him to get in touch with his femininity, you're you're headed in the wrong direction. You need to enjoy how God has created him just as he needs to enjoy how God has created you. So that's important. So let me give you the last question. Women want to know, why won't he take the spiritual lead in our family? Why won't he take the spiritual lead in our family? Now let me give you a couple of things that's very important. You need to realize that men read differently than women. In fact, we don't like to read. We'd rather wait till the movie comes out you know that's true. Uh, men pray differently. We, we verbalize our prayers differently. We approach prayer differently. And by the way, it is hard for us as men to say, I need help. It goes right against how God has created us to want to provide. And if we have to say, I need help, it's saying, I'm failing at providing. I'm failing at leading. So it's difficult for me to say, I need help. Hang on to that thought. Ladies, you can take a cue from another lady to help your spouse become the spiritual leader that you dream him of being. Let me tell you who that lady is. Mary, the mother of Jesus. There's a great miracle. In fact, it's the first miracle that happened at Canaan. where You know the miracle where Jesus was at this wedding feast and they were running out of wine and he turned water into wine. But let me give you uh, a, a couple of things from this, this miracle from Mary. So if you want your husband to lead, here it is. Let me give you the first one. Give him a hint. Give him a hint. Watch this. There in this first verse that I want to show you out of John, John chapter 2, verse 3, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. That's a hint. Ladies, you want your husband to lead spiritually? Give him a hint. That's what you're looking for. Don't, don't shame him. Don't tell him, I wish you would, would lead us spiritually. I wish you'd lead our family in prayer. I wish you'd open up the Bible. I wish you'd take a... Just give him a hint. Give him a hint. That's what Jesus' mom did. Then, number two, I will tell you, watch this. This is so cool. Put it up here in the very next verse. Give him some time. Give him some time to process what he's going to do and how he's going to do it. He may not do it on your timetable or how you do it, but give him, give him some time to process it. Look at this next verse. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. Now, Mary knew her son. She knew he cared about people and their feelings. He cared about people being embarrassed. And now he's processing when he's going to do it. He knew he had the ability. His mother 
knew he had the ability. So she gave him some time to process what he would do. Now, once you look at this next verse, the next verse literally tells us, as you give him the benefit of the doubt, watch what Mary does. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. You hear that? She gave him the benefit of the doubt. She knew what he was going to do. And so she just told the servants, get ready. Something's getting ready to happen. You see, ladies, you need to understand, as I heard it said recently, men, your husbands, they may be in their 30s, their 40s, 50s, or add on, but let me tell you who they really are. They're still on the inside, that little 10-year-old boy growing up. They're 10-year-olds. They're not even teenagers. They're 10-year-olds. You remember what it was like to be a 10-year-old? They would, you, when you were a 10-year-old, you ran up to your mom and said, hey, mom, look at this. Look what I did. Look at my muscles. Look how strong I am. And she'd look at you. Oh, I'm so proud of you, what you did. That was so good. And, and mom would applaud. And she, oh, you're so strong. You're strong just like your dad. Yeah, I am. And everything he would do, he would do something and co- go run to his mom and say, mom, looky, looky, looky. Look what I did. Look what I accomplished. Look what I can do. Watch this, mom. And as long as she would applaud him, he would keep coming back for affirmation. Let me just tell you something. You are married to a 10-year-old on the inside. Now, guys, you may not like it, but you know you are. And there is nothing like the applause and the affirmation from your wife that will get you to do anything, anything for her. As long as you know there is affirmation and applause and encouragement, you'll do it. You, you'll put your feet down and drag your heels if there is nagging, coercing manipulation, but you respond to applause. You know why? Because that's how God's created you. Ladies, you need to know, you tell your husband, I, you're just not the spiritual leader that I want you to be. You're, you're disappointing me, blah, blah, blah. And you know what? He's going to begin to shrink on the inside. But if, on the other hand, you begin to say things like this, I just love it when you lead in prayer. Nothing blesses my heart and makes me full when I hear you pray, when you initiate even opening the Bible. I love it. Oh, I just love it when you share a verse that God's using in your life and you're telling me about what God is doing in your life and your challenges and what you're praying for. I just love that just makes me feel so secure. I just want to tell you, I enjoy watching you take a stand for Christ. You do that. You begin to speak those kinds of words into his life. You better stand back because you're getting ready to see a man of God step forth and lead like no other way. If you walk around telling all your friends, I just wish he'd be the spiritual leader, you're, gonna, you're, you're literally throwing dynamite into the relationship, and you're destroying the dream by your own words. You know, Proverbs talks about a wise woman tears or builds her family up, but a, an unwise woman will tear her family down. And sometimes it's with the very words that we say that does more tearing. Now, by the way, I I didn't come here just to hammer the women. I didn't. Because let me tell you something, guys, God wants you to be a spiritual leader. But the reason why many of us as men have a difficult time being spiritual leaders is because we don't want to admit, I need help. But the power position for a man of God is coming to the place to say, I need help. Oh, God, I need help. And when you admit your failure, you admit your sin, and you admit your helplessness, that's when you're in the power position. That's when God begins to move in your life. You see, real men, real godly men, are the kinds of husbands that have learned to both lead as well as lean, trusting God to provide and guide. But that won't happen until we admit, I need help. And that goes against the very grain while we were created and how we were created. We want to be in charge. We want to always have the answers. But let's face it, we don't. Only God does. And the sooner we get there, 
the sooner we'll be able to lead our families and lead our marriages like God wants us to lead. In just a moment, Dr. Dodd will return with a closing thought. Higher Aim is beginning our third year broadcasting on the air. Oh, what a privilege to share the gospel, and you're part of that. And I wanna encourage you to partner with us by giving a reoccurring gift to help support the ministry. You can do that by going to higheraim.org or sign up by calling the 800 number, which is on the screen. Being a monthly partner will help us reach many more for Christ. Thank you in advance. I am so glad that you have made it all the way to this point. So let me ask you a question. Where are you in your relationship with the Lord? Now, you may not like what your husband does, and maybe he doesn't like what you do. You may be upset with your wife and you're wondering, God, why won't you change her? When in reality, maybe the question we need to be asking is, God, what do you want to do in my life? Do you have a relationship with Jesus as Lord of your life? I pray that you do. And if you don't, or you're going through a difficult time right now and you just need somebody with skin on to pray for you, I want you to pick up the phone right now and call us. We have folks who are standing by right now who would consider it an honor to pray with you about your relationship, your family, as well as your own personal needs right now. And especially if you've never given your life to Christ, would you call us? We wanna show you how, even right now. So the number's on the screen, pick up that phone and call us, would you? Also, let me just tell you, we'd love for you to keep connected to Higher Aim during the week. I wanna encourage you this week, in fact, you may wanna do that today, is to go to your app store and download Higher Aim app. It is a great way for you to not only partner with us in giving, but you can partner with us in receiving our devotions, uh, our teaching letter, and you can sign up all through that app. Now, of course, you can go online at higheraim.org and do much of the same, but in today's technology, well, you've got to have an app. And so we've got an app, and I want to invite you to connect with us, would you? Well, God bless you for watching this week, and I'm praying that God will deepen your relationship with Him so that your relationship with others, especially your spouse, will begin to deepen just like God wants. Until next time, keep your eyes on Jesus. He is the highest aim. Thank you for joining us on Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. For more information and free resources, please visit us at higheraim.org. The preceding program was brought to you by the faithful supporters of Higher Aim.